Welcome back everybody to linuxacademy.com. My name is Terry and in today's course we continue with Docker Quick Start. So over the course of the last couple of videos we've talked a lot about our base images and we've got a number of them installed on our Linux Academy lab server now. Now what do we do with those? Now in a previous video when we were talking about the base images we did run an actual container, the Hello World application. So the container that runs off of the base image called Hello World was run with Docker run Hello World and then by default Hello World will assume you mean latest unless you give it a different tag which would then assume that we have an a image named Hello World with a different tag. In this case all we're doing is running Hello World. Now we can search as we talked about for base images with our Docker search. There's another base image that is what's called the Docker Whale Say. And the Docker Whale Say is just a, another basic base image that containers can be based on that Docker makes available to demonstrate how containers work. And in fact, it looks like there have been a number of people who have posted the Docker Whale Say base image with whatever their specific spins on it are but we can pull it with a docker pull docker and then whale say and it'll pull all of the base image file system layers the root file system layers that are representative of how that particular image was built once that image is installed of course then we can simply run the container just like we did hello world but what we can do is we can run it with a specific message so whale say is very similar to the cow say, which is it gives us the ability basically to just say, hey, I want you to say something. I want you to display a message. We're just using this as a simple introduction to running a container. All this container is going to do is we're saying run a container based on docker slash whale say. And just so you know, you can run a container based on a base image even if it's not installed on your local system, as long as it's something that can be reached through the remote repository you're, you're connected to. In our case, since we're pulling images from the Docker Hub, if Docker Whale Say was not installed locally, it would attempt to run the container by downloading that image first. So it's kind of a way of doing a Docker pull and then a Docker run on the same command. I generally like to pull them down because my containers start a lot more quickly if I'm running off of a local copy of a particular image. So we're going to say docker run docker whale say and we're going to say hello. And all this is going to do is it's going to build this little cool looking whale and he's going to say hello. And in fact I can pass in different messages and the cow say is actually the application that the container is running, which happens to just display what I put in there. I am Docker. So it's, it's just a way to run a container. Now, when we run a container, it is done with the Docker run command. But I've launched a number of different containers now. How do I tell what containers may be running on my system? Well, it all starts and ends with my Docker command, but now I want to say PS, tell me what containers are running. It's, it's a process list from within my Docker daemon. Well, I'm not running anything. Well, why would that be? Because each of the containers that I've run so far have instantiated, run the command that they were meant to run, and then exited. So in fact, if I look at Docker images and I say Docker inspect, docker whale say, I can figure out what this container was meant to do based upon what's in here, including the working directory in that container will be cow say. The environment is set here. It'll start shell dash C, which is for a command. So it's literally going to start up the command with the shell prompt in the working directory called cow say and it's going to actually run the, the command and pass in what it is that I pass to it, which in, in the last case was I am Docker. 
So because it was able to execute that command and exit, it doesn't show up as currently running, but I can get a list of containers that I have run that are in the stopped state by doing a ps-a. ps-a says, here, you've run a couple of Docker whale says, you've run a hello world, a hello world latest, you've run it based on the image name. Again, when we ran the hello world, we indicated that we could use an image name. Each container, much like our image, is assigned a unique container ID. And that container ID is how it determines all of the, the file structures that are necessary to support it and how it's linked to the underlying image. And we'll talk about how images and containers are linked when we talk about how to manage those things, particularly once they've been stopped, so that you, you don't fill up your drive space with a whole bunch of stopped containers that you can actually remove. You can see each of these containers of the five we started. Here's the command that that container starts up with. In this case, it starts up with cal say hello, cal say I am docker. And then you'll see these names, ecstatic Newton, distracted Brahmagupta, peaceful Jennings. So docker by default, when you start a container, will not only assign a container ID, but will assign a more user-friendly or easier to work with name with an underscore between them. So it has a, a random list of names that it, it kind of puts together. And, the, and some of them can be humorous, like Happy Borg, Peaceful Jennings. So those names are how we can refer to a container. So for example, if I wanted to see a particular container, I could say Docker inspect Happy Borg. Now, Part of the problem with doing an inspect on a container that is not running is you're not going to get things like the IP address, etc. Things that would only be populated if your container was actually running. But there's a whole host of information that we can get as a result of an inspect on a container. And that does include all of the CPU information, devices that are attached, IP addresses, the command that it's run, etc., etc. Whether it's IPv6 or IPv4. Now, my IP addresses are based upon the automatically installed Docker Zero interface and the default network of 172.17.0. It's a full class C network, so it will automatically assign IP addresses in the range of 172.17.0.2 through 254. If you go beyond 254 active containers, then you'll have a problem on a single host. However, that's generally not the case. You can also define your network to be some other address, including it having it be a class B or a class A address if you like. If you want to see how to do that specific configuration, that's in our Docker Deep Dive course in how you would customize your Docker network. So this is automatically set up. These are all the defaults. Again, this is a quick start. We're not going to make any changes to this. We're going to get a, an IP in the 172.17.0. And in likelihood, if we've got one container running, we're going to do dot two. Unless we've statically assigned an address. Again, we'll, we cover that in the, the network settings in our Docker Deep Dive. So we have these containers that we can refer to by container ID or the name but we've, we've got limited information available to us because these containers are stopped. Well, what we need to do now is we need a running container. Now, the problem with a, a, a base image that has a configured command that will run is if it can run and complete, the container doesn't hang around long. It only hangs around as long as needed in order to run that particular command. However, we can start a container and exercise a little bit more control over a container by indicating what we want it to run, particularly in the case of base images like CentOS. So here, let's run a container. And what we want to do is we want to run that container in interactive mode, dash I, connected to the terminal, which is T, and if we wanted to run it in the background, we didn't want to attach to it at this point, we could run D for disconnected, but in this case, let's do dash IT, so interactively connected to my current terminal or TTY. 
I want to run the CentOS latest, and then I provide the name of the command that I want my container to start up with. In this case, let's create a bin bash shell. Because I'm running it interactively and on my terminal, it's going to automatically attach me as the root user in the bin bash prompt. So let's go here and we can see we're actually logged in to this particular container. This container we're actually running as a user, who am I, root, on this particular container. So if I do, for example, a yum command, yum upgrade, it's actually going to update the packages from inside my container and install in my container these applications or these updates to it. I'm no longer working on my host operating system. I'm working on my container operating system. Now my container operating system is by no means a full operating system. My container only contains the libraries and dependencies that are necessary to run the minimal amount of programs that I have installed. And in fact, I don't have things like SSH or Telnet even installed on this particular container. The only command that's currently running on this container is what I started it up with in interactive mode, which is bin bash. Now, for example, if I come over here and I SSH to tcox4, which is where my containers are, which is where my container is running over here. Now let's do a Docker PS. Now Docker PS is, tells me what is running, and right now I have CentOS latest running bin bash, and it's assigned a name called condescending wing to this particular container. Now what happens when I exit this container? So let's exit the command prompt, and let's go back over here and just reissue the Docker PS. It's now gone, and if I do a Docker PS minus A, then I'll see the last container that has been run, which was bin bash, is condescending wing. Because I started up that container with the command for bin bash, when I exited the bash prompt, the command that instantiated the container is now done in the container exit. It's a clean exit. It's basically you saying, okay, I'm done with this container instance. You can go ahead and exit the container. Now there's another way that we can do that same thing and we don't have to cause the container to exit every time we run the command. If I want to run bin bash, for example, in the background and I want the container to run without me being connected to it, then that's where I can do the docker run dash D and then I want to say CentOS latest bin bash. Then you'll see it assigns this Docker identifier to the container. So this is my container ID. Docker PS shows that it's now exited. And Docker PS minus A shows this as the last container that was run. Because all I did was execute bin bash, it executed bin bash, assigned a Docker container ID, and then exited the container. But if I wanted to write, for example, a script as part of my launching it, I could say I want you to execute a command and then I could do a do while script that actually runs constantly until I exit or attached to that container. So now that my containers have run and I can see how I can start them up interactively, which attaches me directly to that container, logs me in as the root user, and then I can execute commands from within it, or I can run a container in detached mode. Now that's why I would be more interested, for example, let's take a look at Docker Images. Now Docker Images, Nginx, I know from doing a Docker inspect on that, actually starts the Nginx web server. So since that starts the Nginx web server, unless I attach to the container directly and then exit out, does that mean that a web instance would be available based upon that container? 
Well, let's find out. Let's do a docker run dash D. And so we're, we're running in disconnected mode, Nginx latest. And we're, we don't have to indicate that we're going to run any command because in this case, the Nginx image, when a container is instantiated, just runs the command the Nginx and it runs in the foreground. So now, when I run a Docker PS, I see that this container continues to be running because it's turned off the daemon. It's running Nginx G, which is running in direct mode rather than in background because we don't have daemon or service controls. My container continues to run. Now I can find out, for example, I can do a Docker inspect on that container. So let's do Docker PS, Docker inspect tiny pasteur. We could do the Docker inspect on the container IP or ID or the name. So Docker inspect tiny pasteur. Now what we're looking for is luckily right down here towards the bottom, we're looking at this particular IP address. Can I ping that IP address? 172.17.0.2. I can because that container is running. So now should I be able to view the web page? And you'll notice if I do a Docker PS, one of the things that it tells me under the status is the ports that are running on. I have ports 80 and 443 that are exposed on the IP address of that particular container. These ports get exposed as part of the Docker file or when we start the Docker container up. But again, we're going to talk about redirection in a future video. All we need to know now is these ports were exposed as a result of how the container was built off the image in the Docker file. So I should be able to see port 80 on 172.17.0.2. Do I have eLinks installed? I do not. So let's do a, let's do su dash and let's do a yum install eLinks. And eLinks, for those of you who may not know, is just a text-based web browser. We just want to be able to see if we can connect to that Docker instance. So Docker PS, and let's do an eLinks, HTTP 172.17.0.2, which is the IP of the container called Tiny Pasteur. And then we see, when we open it up, we see the Nginx web server is successfully installed and working. Now, I don't have this running on my local system, meaning that port 80 on my local system, yum install telnet, is not actually doing anything. It is only running on the container that I've instantiated here. So for example, if I did an eLinks HTTP localhost, I'm not going to get anything. Just like if I did a telnet localhost on 80, but if I do a telnet on 172.17.0.2 on port 80, I get what I would expect, a response back from my web server. So my container is running and I can, I can attach to a container that's running or I can run another command. So we're going to take a look at the container lifecycle as we continue to go through here. Now, I do want to tell you that we can say docker stop on tiny pasteur. And what that does is now when I do a docker ps, that is now no longer running, and doing a docker ps minus a has moved it to containers that are currently off. It's the status is exited seven seconds ago. One further thing I want to talk about in this video is so far we've dealt with container IDs or container names that have been automatically associated for us with our container ID. We do have full control over the naming convention, but each name that we assign to a container has to be unique. Once I've used a name, I can no longer use that name for, for additional containers until I've removed completely, even when the container stopped, until I've removed completely all evidence of it. So that name is tracked in the internal database of Docker so that it can't be reused. It keeps you from accidentally reusing a name because you have the ability to do other things during the container lifecycle. 
So how would I do that? So if we do Docker images, we'll again run the Nginx image. So let's do a Docker run. We're going to do dash D dash dash name equals myweb1. And then we want to run the Nginx latest. Now, if we do a Docker PS, we see that it's running, but the name that's associated with it is called myweb1. And therefore, when I do a Docker inspect, I can say myweb1 rather than worry about the container and or having to look up that particular container ID or IP address. It's again assigned to 172.17.0.2 because it's the only container, so it's automatically going to grab in the DHCP pool the next one in, in the available IP addresses. If I were to start another container, for example, if I wanted to start another container and I wanted to call it MyWeb2, then I want to run Docker Inspect on MyWeb2, you'll see that my IP address is now 172.17.0.3. But that's also one of the advantages is because I have two containers, for example, that are both listening on port 80 on one single host, but because they have unique container IP addresses, I can refer to them by that IP. Now that gets into how do I access the containers that are happening to run on my host? Well, I can set some static routes if I want, or I can run a front end container mechanism like Kubernetes that manages my containers with load balancing and external IPs and things like that. We also have a deep dive on Kubernetes at Linux Academy, so if you're interested in cluster management of your containers, I recommend you take a look at that course. I teach that one as well. So this is kind of how we run our containers. We have containers that are ephemeral, things that start up with a particular command, they execute that command, and then they immediately exit, and there's no further interaction that's required on your part. And they appear in the Docker PS-A as containers that have been stopped. They've run their command and they've stopped. We can attach to containers by starting an inst a base image a container based on a base image that is just making itself available. We start up bin bash, we can interactive with, we can be interactive with it, logged in as root, run some commands, and as soon as we exit the command that we told the container to start with, it again stops and the container is no longer running. We have other container types that are based on base images that say, I want you to run this command, and as long as the command's running, the container will be running. And that's what these are, because Nginx starts up when we run a container based on the base image for Nginx latest. So it will continue to run until we stop the container itself. So we could do docker stop myweb1 and docker stop myweb2. And then now we go docker ps, nothing is there, and docker ps minus a. So these are all ways that we can run our containers and the different behavior of running containers, whether we do that interactively, whether we run it as a daemon in the background, and we just take advantage of the service that it provides. Next, we'll talk about how the containers have a life cycle associated with them so that we can look at, well, can, can I, what can I do with containers once they're stopped? Well, there's a whole life cycle associated with stopping, starting, executing, attaching, and then being able to clean those containers up. And then we'll also look at how we manage images in the future. But for running containers, for a quick start, being able to pull down base images and then launch containers based on those base images, that's all there is to it. My name is Terry for Linux Academy.